Hi guys and thank you for tuning in. Today I'm going to show you how not to kill your patient with this. My name is Alex Hepner and this is Group Call. If you think that hyperventilation during CPR is a new idea, you're completely wrong. Everything started in 18th century when Dr. John Fortegill officially uh, listed advantages of mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation over bell's ventilation, because that's what they've been using for CPR back in 18th century. He found out that bells create a huge pressure that basically rupture a patient's lungs. Today we would call it iatrogenic barotrauma. Now, for the next 200 years, scientists were arguing over the best method of artificial ventilation up to 1953 when Dr. Holger Hesse created this, a BVM, and called it AMBU, Artificial Manual Breathing Unit. The world of medicine loved this device, and up to 2004, no one really pointed out risks associated with using of BVM. The storm started in 2004 when Professor Tom Aldeheide published this research, where he proven that professional rescuers were observed to excessively ventilate patients during out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, which led to increased intrathoracic pressure, impaired venous return, and decreased coronary perfusion and lower survival rates. In other words, if you will keep squeezing the bag too firmly during CPR, you may kill your patient even if you won't explode their lungs. For more in-depth knowledge of pathophysiology of hyperventilation during CPR, please see this episode of Group Call Life. I will leave the link in the description to this video. Anyway, if we know that hyperventilation during CPR may kill our patients, why we still do it? Okay, there were some research papers, uh, including this, trying to answer this question, but I feel that no one actually said it loud enough. It's the bad training and bad equipment we use. You want to prove? Here you go. This is most commonly used mannequin in training across the world. Now, for ages, we were focused on chest compressions. So manufacturers were creating more and more sophisticated systems of chest compressions. Now, we completely forgot about ventilation. Hence why the lungs in this mannequin is just a plastic bag under the thick layer of plastic. Does it really reflect physiology of lungs? Not at all. I'm sure that after this episode, I will be chased by angry mob of mannequins manufacturers. But let's be honest, equipment is just a part of this problem. The next part of the problem is us, trainers, clinical mentors, educators. How we teach ventilation? Oh, squeeze the bag up to the moment you can see chest rise and fall. But in this less posh mannequin, you can see chest rise and fall only if you will squeeze the bag like that and I'm going to prove it in a second. Good C grip, and I'm squeezing the bag just a bit. Can you see chest rise and fall? Not really. Now I will squeeze the bag firmly. Now you can see chest rise and fall, right? Now let's go to this, a bit more sophisticated mannequin. Good C grip. And just a bit. Look, you can see chest rise and fall. When we know where the problem is, let's think about correct ventilation, all right? Now, you may ask, how the hell I know how much my patient needs? Okay, let's think about it. An average human being needs six to seven meals of air per kilo. With babies, it's six to seven per kilo. For adults, it's six to seven per kilo kilo of ideal body mass. You may ask me, Alex, how the hell I should know what is my patient's ideal body mass? It's quite simple. You estimate your patient height and then take away 100. I'm 190 centimeters. Take away 100, 90, 90. This is my ideal body mass, which is quite reassuring because I'm still slightly below. Now, you multiply this number by six or seven. Let's say seven, okay? For me, 90 times seven gives you 630. That's the tidal volume. That's my tidal, tidal volume. So this BVM, it's 1,600 mils. So I don't need this. I need less than half of this volume. If I will collapse and you will perform CPR on me and you will ventilate 630 mils, that's how, that's how much I need. If you will squeeze it too firmly, you may kill me. 
please don't kill me. Okay, so 630 mils, but how much you need to squeeze to get this 630 mils? Just like that, or maybe like that. Guys, it's not good enough. How you give your morphine or adenosine or, 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 or fentanyl? You don't give it just like that. You use precise tools to measure it. And remember, oxygen is also a medicine. So maybe we should use precise devices to measure how we give oxygen, especially during CPR. So one of the devices I came across recently is this. It's called EO Life X. Uh, I will leave the link to the manufacturer's website uh, in the description below. By the way, there is no conflict of interest. I was not paid to show you this device. Now, all you need to do is pick your patient's size. And do you want 30 to do or continuous? And now, in training mode, you can choose blind ventilation or in the clinical mode, you can choose controlled ventilation. And then you just squeeze the bag. And the device will actually tell you how much you need to squeeze and if you have any leak. But the fact that manufacturer says that something is great doesn't mean that it's true. So what I decided to do is I decided to run a quick test in Top Gear style. But those poor buggers from Top Gear had only one stig to test things. And I have three. Okay guys, that's it. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to subscribe to the channel and hit the like button. And the most important thing, please remember, do not hyperventilate your patients during CPR. My name is Alex Hepner and this was Group Call.